California is drowning right now, and what scientists just discovered about these Christmas floods should terrify everyone. The water crushing the state isn't just breaking 150-year records, it's literally changing California's shape. Satellite data shows something that has emergency officials in complete panic. The weight of billions of tons of flood water is causing the ground itself to sink, triggering earthquakes along fault lines that haven't moved in decades. This isn't just the worst flooding in California history. This is the catastrophe that could finally trigger the big one. December 23rd started like any other morning until 3.47 a.m. when everything changed. The National Weather Service in Sacramento issued their first life-threatening flood warning as atmospheric river number one slammed into Eureka. Within minutes, rain was falling at four inches per hour across Humboldt County. Emergency operations centers from San Francisco to Los Angeles activated simultaneously, something that had never happened before in California's entire history. By 5.15 a.m., the California Office of Emergency Services went into full crisis mode. Director Mark Chen found himself coordinating with 58 county emergency offices as terrifying reports flooded in from every corner of the state. The Russian River rose eight feet in just two hours, transforming from a peaceful waterway into a monster that devoured everything in its path. Sonoma County ordered 12,000 residents to evacuate immediately as officials realized this was unlike anything they'd ever seen. The numbers were already staggering, but they kept getting worse. At 6.23 a.m., atmospheric river number two crashed into the central coast with unprecedented fury. Monterey Bay recorded wind gusts of 85 miles per hour while rain fell at six inches per hour across coastal communities. The Salinas River became a raging torrent that overwhelmed century-old levees in minutes, levees that had survived every major storm in California history until this Christmas morning. Interstate 101 became impassable near San Luis Obispo as floodwaters surged across the highway with terrifying speed. California Highway Patrol reported water depths of eight feet covering the roadway, turning one of California's major arteries into a deadly river. Emergency responders scrambled to rescue motorists trapped in submerged vehicles, but the water kept rising faster than rescue teams could respond. Then came the third atmospheric river, approaching from the southwest and targeting Southern California with moisture content that exceeded anything in recorded history. NOAA meteorologist Dr. Lisa Rodriguez described it as three fire hoses of moisture aimed directly at California. Her voice carried an edge of alarm that veterans of the National Weather Service had never heard before. Emergency shelters filled beyond capacity within hours. The American Red Cross opened 47 facilities, activating every disaster protocol they had. But demand overwhelmed resources immediately. Families arrived with nothing but hastily packed bags. Children cried for toys left behind. Elderly residents needed immediate medical attention that overwhelmed staff struggled to provide. Power outages cascaded across the state as transmission lines failed. Pacific Gas and Electric reported 340,000 customers without electricity by 8 a.m., with numbers climbing rapidly. The darkness made everything worse, rescue operations struggled without streetlights, and residents lost their ability to charge phones or access emergency information. The California National Guard deployed 2,400 personnel in the largest emergency mobilization since the 1994 Northridge earthquake. Helicopter crews worked around the clock, plucking families from rooftops as floodwaters rose faster than ground teams could respond. Pilots described scenes that looked apocalyptic. Entire neighborhoods transformed into lakes with only rooftops visible above churning brown water. Transportation infrastructure collapsed completely. Interstate 5 closed between Sacramento and Los Angeles, cutting California in half. San Francisco International Airport canceled over 400 flights as runway flooding made operations impossible, stranding thousands of holiday travelers. Inside the California Office of Emergency Services headquarters, the operations floor had become a war room by 9 a.m. Phones rang constantly, screens flickered with alerts, and staff worked overlapping 12-hour shifts as the crisis escalated beyond all planning scenarios. Every decision carried life-or-death consequences. By 10.15 a.m., Governor Gavin Newsom declared a statewide emergency as the third atmospheric river made landfall near Los Angeles. The National Guard deployment expanded to 4,800 personnel, the largest domestic disaster response in California history. Helicopter rescue operations struggled against 90-mile-per-hour winds and zero visibility. The first confirmed fatality came at 11.23 a.m. A 67-year-old man in Petaluma swept away while attempting to move his car to higher ground. Within hours, the death toll climbed as rescue teams found more victims trapped in submerged vehicles. 
resource strain hit immediately. Sonoma County's emergency shelters reached 150% capacity, forcing officials to open high school gymnasiums. Families slept on cots in hallways while overwhelmed staff struggled to provide basic care. Communication systems buckled under the emergency load. Cell towers failed across 12 counties. Emergency radio networks strained as first responders coordinated rescues in conditions they'd never encountered. Agricultural losses mounted catastrophically. The Central Valley disappeared beneath floodwaters that destroyed $1.2 billion in crops within 18 hours. Dairy operations evacuated 45,000 cattle, but many farms lost everything to the relentless water. At NOAA's Climate Prediction Center in Maryland, meteorologists stared at satellite data that defied every atmospheric model in their database. Dr. Sarah Chen reviewed moisture content readings that exceeded anything in recorded history. The three atmospheric rivers converging over California carried water vapor equivalent to 15 Mississippi rivers flowing through the sky. The numbers were unprecedented and terrifying. The first atmospheric river showed integrated water vapor transport of 1,200 kilograms per meter per second. Normal winter storms rarely exceed 500. The second system measured 1,400. The third peaked at 1,600, a reading that climate models suggested was impossible under current atmospheric conditions. Dr. Michael Torres at UC San Diego's Scripps Institution analyzed the storm structure with growing alarm. The atmospheric rivers exhibited behavior never documented in meteorological science. Instead of dissipating after landfall, they maintained intensity and fed energy between each other through mechanisms that atmospheric physics couldn't fully explain. Temperature profiles revealed another disturbing anomaly. The storms carried tropical moisture from near the equator directly to California's coast without the typical cooling that should occur over thousands of miles. Sea surface temperatures along the storm track measured 4 to 6 degrees Celsius above normal. NASA's Hurricane Hunter aircraft, diverted from Atlantic operations, penetrated the atmospheric rivers to gather direct measurements. The moisture content readings were off their instrument scales, conditions that shouldn't exist in Earth's current climate system. Maria Santos clutched her 8-year-old daughter's hand as they waded through knee-deep water toward the evacuation bus in Guerneville. Behind them, their home of 15 years disappeared beneath the Russian River's surge. They carried nothing but a backpack with family photos, medications, and a stuffed elephant that hadn't left Sophia's side since the sirens began. The evacuation center at Santa Rosa High School filled beyond capacity by noon. The Red Cross reported 47 emergency shelters across Northern California housing 85,000 displaced residents. In Petaluma, 73-year-old Robert Chen refused to leave his dairy farm despite mandatory evacuation orders. His 200 Holstein cattle stood in water up to their bellies as he struggled to move them to higher ground. Children woke to constant helicopter noise and emergency sirens. Eight-year-old Tommy Rodriguez hadn't slept through the night since his family fled their Sebastopol home. His mother reported that anxiety medications for children had run out at three emergency shelters. Agricultural communities faced catastrophic losses that would ripple through California's economy for years. The Sonoma County Farm Bureau estimated crop damage exceeding $800 million in wine grapes alone. Small family farms that survived generations faced bankruptcy as floodwaters destroyed equipment, livestock, and entire seasons of work. In Sacramento, Governor Newsom convened an emergency cabinet meeting as damage assessments poured in. Infrastructure damage exceeded $15 billion and climbing. Agricultural losses topped $3.2 billion. The economic impact threatened to surpass Hurricane Katrina's devastation. FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell arrived within 24 hours, facing the agency's largest domestic deployment since Hurricane Sandy. Over 8,000 personnel coordinated relief efforts across 23 counties, but resources strained immediately as the scale of destruction became clear. Political tensions emerged as Congress debated emergency funding. Insurance executives held emergency meetings as flood damage claims exceeded $25 billion in the first week alone. Many homeowners discovered their policies excluded flood damage, leaving them financially devastated. Economic ripple effects spread nationwide. The Port of Oakland, handling 40% of West Coast container traffic, remained closed. Supply chain disruptions affected retailers as holiday inventory sat stranded in flooded warehouses. Napa Valley wineries reported $2 billion in damage. Disneyland closed for the first time due to natural disaster. One week after the initial assault, California's emergency operations maintained crisis status. 
The National Weather Service continued flood warnings for 15 counties with river levels dangerously high. Over 125,000 residents remained under evacuation orders. FEMA deployed 12,000 personnel, the largest domestic disaster response in agency history. Power restoration struggled against continued flooding. Pacific Gas and Electric reported 450,000 customers still without electricity. The death toll reached 47 confirmed fatalities with 23 people still missing. Agricultural damage assessments revealed losses that would affect food prices nationwide. The California Department of Food and Agriculture reported $4.8 billion in crop damage. Emergency shelters housed 78,000 displaced residents across 52 facilities. Climate scientists continue analyzing the unprecedented storm patterns. The three atmospheric rivers that converged simultaneously represented conditions that models projected wouldn't occur until 2040. The acceleration of extreme weather patterns challenges fundamental assumptions about climate change's pace. International research examines whether California's floods signal a global shift in atmospheric circulation. Similar extreme weather events across the Northern Hemisphere suggest the jet stream disruption is part of a hemisphere-wide reorganization of weather systems. Community resilience emerged as the most powerful force in recovery. Neighbors helped neighbors, churches opened doors to displaced families, and volunteers coordinated relief efforts. But individual resilience cannot address systemic vulnerabilities that climate change continues to expose. California's recovery will take years, providing lessons for climate adaptation nationwide. The floods have receded, but questions about our changing climate continue to flow. The climate crisis is no longer a future threat, but a present reality demanding immediate response. That's it for today, folks. See you in the next video.